Dr. Sophie Parker, who's consultant clinical psychologist, and they're going to talk to the the um, frankly existential topic of why should we divert scarce resources to research? And this is a, a great way of framing it. So uh, many times in the past years, I've come across preconceptions in NHS providers that for them, research is all about risk, financial risk, governance risk, clinical risk, that sort of thing. And why on earth should they get involved in it, let alone divert potential resources into it. So it's a very interesting title. So uh, Alice, I will hand over to you and um, and Sophie. Brilliant. Um, thanks, Shown. And Sophie is going to share the slides because I seem to be I seem to be mid IT failure at the moment, and I'm not sure whether my face has disappeared or not. Maybe it hasn't. Um, brilliant. Thanks, Sophie. Um, so we're going to do this as a double act um, with us both talking at the same time. So that may or may not uh, may or may not work. Um, so I'm Alice Seaborn, Medical Director at GMMH. Um, and I think I am a jobbing clinician um, and think that jobbing clinicians should be involved in research and should be interested in research. Um, and it's it's for everybody. And I suppose um, that people don't, as Shone says, people don't always think that when they're jobbing clinicians. Sophie, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, sure. Um, hi, I'm Sophie Parker. I'm a clinical psychologist at GMH. And I lead our youth mental health research unit, which we'll talk about. Um, and similar to Alice, have been a job in clinician for many years and really believe passionately in integrating research and clinical services for the benefit of our users and our families. So, yeah, back to you, Alice. Brilliant. And, and I think that it's really important, isn't it, that when we're thinking about diverting scarce resources, what we're not just talking about is about financial resources to support research because I think we've been lucky enough to use um, RCF funding for many of our um, for our research units um, but it's about diverting our minds as well and our kind of curiosity to be involved um, in research and our you know just each time that we're having conversations about things thinking what don't I know about this? How can I be doing this better? So, um, so Sophie, should we move to the next slide? Oh, we've already moved to the next slide because I'm, <laughs> I'm juggling things very slowly and badly here, I'm afraid. So, so just thinking about what, what the benefits of research, um, and I, I remember one fact about this, which is the first fact, which is research active trusts um, have better outcomes for people and um, I think that that's really important, isn't it? That if we're professionally and personally curious about things, we're probably professionally and personally more curious about our patients. Um, we would be we would be engaged in research, we'd be thinking about better treatments. And so, so from my point of view, that's better outcomes for my patients, which is always um, absolutely the most important thing. Um, from a board point of view, that's better. CQC ratings, isn't it? And board should want um, better outcomes for people. So I think our our board is understands that that research active healthcare is better care, um, and the NHS should be at the forefront of um, scientific development. You know, it's part of the core constitution of us, um, and. I think both Sophie and I would agree that it's really important that we're asking the right questions um, for individuals and their health care, but also that we're asking questions about people who are perhaps underserved from a research point of view. So thinking about EDI, thinking about mental health um, and that this helps us deliver our services better. Um, you know, gone are the days of us having one service and people having to fit into it, hopefully. Um, and then we need to lead locally about um, innovations, what's good from an innovation point of view and uh, ups, ups, uh, spreading it at speed. Um, and I think the, the bottom point is really important. Have I dropped out? No, you're still here. I'm still there. It's gone beep on me. Sophie. I think the bottom point is really important, isn't it? About it's not it's not our job. So, I think as really busy clinicians, sometimes um, if the research and the research team isn't embedded in your service, 
you can run away from the researcher who's trying to get you involved in in the trial and I think Sophie what you described from your team point of view is really good about being you are core to the service that you work in aren't you um so well absolutely we'll come on to that in a, a little bit so I think it is our core business whatever anybody says um and so Sophie I think we're moving on to the next slide now aren't we brilliant yeah. and um I think do you want to talk to this because I think this is really important isn't it from a from a philosophy point of view yeah so we thought this was a really nice quote to include that when it's our own or our family's care at the local hospital uh, knowing that the best research evidence is informing that care is a fundamental reassurance why wouldn't we look for assurance that our hospital is engaging with research it's just common sense and it's absolutely true I think in terms of what we're looking for that you know that you're the treatment that you're getting or a family member is getting is informed and backed up by um, cutting edge research and evidence or that you might be invited to take part in um, treatments that aren't currently on offer um, and I think it gives you reassurance just like Alice really nicely describes that that's the ethos and the philosophy of the staff that within that um, treatment provider as well that that's that's what we're really all looking to do is to, to have that better care for the for the service users coming into those contexts so i think it's a good quote brill thanks sophie should we should we move on to the the next slide which is just kind of really uh, our trust has wanted to embed r and i um really robustly in the overall trust strategy so um, we've got a five pillar trust strategy which has r and i in the middle uh, and talks about r and i leading to best outcomes and i think that's that's really important it, it, because if we don't do the r and i bit right we're not going to get the best outcomes and then we relaunched our well we launched our new r and i strategy this year which I think essentially really says R&I is for everybody. It's part of our core business and it needs to be part of our core business. And I think if we kind of move on to the next slide, this really shows some of our um, research infrastructure and that we're trying to build R&I for everybody and to improve the, the quality of our services through this. So you can see we've got, I think that's 10 research units, but actually, but we've got um, the EDI research unit hasn't got its own logo yet, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but so you can see Sophie's research unit um, is on the top right hand side, isn't it, Sophie? Yeah. Um, and do you want to do you want to have a um, do you want to explain about your research unit? Because I think it's a really good example of how how the research unit's embedded and takes on quality improvement within the service and how you you are part of the part of that CAM service. Yes, absolutely. So um, if I move forward to the next slide, it will tell you a bit more about that. So we were pump primed, essentially, the trust had decided to put a call out for some of us to bid for some research unit money. Um, so we've been um, given funding through investment from the trust over the last few years. And essentially that comes to just over 300,000 pounds. Um, by um, taking that money forward, we've been able to generate quite a good degree of grant income up until the 2021 date. And you'll see as well that off the back of the grant income that you bring um, through the trials um, and things that we the awards that we win, it also generates this other income that comes back into the trust to be repurposed called RCF, which is research capability funding. So the trust, the, the trust by investing in ours has enabled us to support this research. And I think particularly what's been important in our research unit is to embed ourselves into clinical services. It's, it's seen as a core part of business. So R and I make it our business to ensure that we're really embedded into clinical services. So for us, that means sitting in clinical services. So we have office space or makeshift office space, I, I should say. It's a bit glorified to call it office space. Um, but essentially, we flexibly come and go. We are core staff, just like everyone else. We're not visitors 
to the ward, for example, when we go on to Junction 17, we're, we're core staff, we, we carry the same um, pins and everything else like everyone else does. We have access, we, we go in and out of um, the staff groups, we run a weekly research group with young people. Um, so we're very much part of core business going into the senior leadership team meetings. And I think that's really important for one of the points we talked about earlier, that the research that we develop off the back of that then is locally driven. It's also then locally delivered. It's also part of the core team and they can feel they can adopt it. Um, so a number of studies have come, um, we've been able to run within our units off the back of that work. So we have a physical health work stream. Um, which we'll talk about a bit more in a minute, but both of these physical health um, trials that we're running, um, so Penny already mentioned the top one, which is um, funded through the ARC, the second one's funded through RFPB, both have come out of quality improvement targets, and then we've been able to work with the clinical teams to envisage those and, and make them even broader and bigger and produce um, locally driven evidence that would help the wider community. We have a prediction and prevention work stream around at-risk mental states um, and we've recently won a £2 million grant for bipolar at-risk work that we've already begun over the years. Um, and then we have some work streams around CAM service and delivery and suicide in young people. <laughs> Thanks, Sophie. And they're, they're really important, aren't they? And I think we, we wanted to go on to talk about the, the physical health um, quality improvement work, which this slide is about. And that's really important because we haven't got it right everywhere, have we? The, the physical health work and um, the, the Motivate trial, which you, you mentioned, Kate, was part of forensic in the forensic services Absolutely. as well, wasn't it? And that was really driven locally and then um, and then picked up by clinicians who are really worried about forensic uh, patients and their um, physical um, ill health and um, metabolic syndromes, wasn't it? So, so this is really important, again, about um, quality improvement with regards to physical health. So I'll hand back to you about that, Sophie. Yeah, so very briefly, because I know Shane's popped his um, face into my uh, screen, so I will... <laughs> Pay attention, show. Um, the sort of Y Health studies are a young person's physical health work stream, which, um, as Penny said, is funded through the ARC. And we, um, this has been led out of quality improvement work, some audit work that we supported our clinical teams um, conducting and then published, and then enabled us to take this even further, monitoring the physical health of our inpatient community of young people there and then prospectively taking that a step further so once people are discharged out into the communities what happens next who picks up that care what's the physical health parameters looking like so uh, it, it's really developed from QI enables us to support that back into the services and it really enables us to work really closely with clinical services to things that are important to them but also things that are there are part of their work and help hopefully helps them by bringing some resource and infrastructure as well. Brill, thanks Sophie. And I think our last slide is just your contact details, isn't it? Yes, definitely. Once again, touch, please do. Great, Brilliant. thank you thank very you. much, Sophie. Um, uh, thank you very much, Alice. That was, that was really a brilliant overview. And I guess um, it's worth saying perhaps that um, uh, this, this measure of, uh, research capability funding. So each trust, each trust, and Sarah Farrell may be talking about this in a minute, but just to say each trust gets an allocation every year of how much RCF funding so-called uh, it gets, which is based on an equivalence measure to the amount of uh, externally funded research it does. And I'm saying this because just to blow the trust trumpet for a minute. So there are 54 mental health trusts in, in, the UK, in England and Greater Manchester Mental Health is now third in that particular annual league table for 2021 after Oxford and South London and Maudsley. So, so it does, it, um, it, it is um, an important measure. So thank you very much both. And um, next, um, we've got uh, Sarah Fallon, who's Chief Operating Officer for uh, Greater Manchester uh, Clinical Research Network, and 